Thank you for coming today to the um, funeral, funeral services for Mark Littleford. My name is Ty Metcalf, and I'm Brother Littleford's bishop, and the family asked me to conduct today and want to recognize our, our good state president, Mark Durham, on the stand, and, and he presides. Also want to um, recognize the pallbearers today, Jonathan Marchant, Cameron Malloy, Carter O'Driscoll, Aiden O'Driscoll, Seth Littleford, Hunter Littleford, Luke Littleford, Samuel Littleford, and honorary Paul Bear, Jaden Malloy. Uh, our, our, the, I'll, I'll just quickly go through the, the outline of, of, the, of the service today. The, the family prayer was offered by son-in-law Justin O'Driscoll, and the prelude and postlude music is, is being offered by Shelley Bess. Our chorister today is, is Gretchen Durham, and we thank them for, for that. Our opening hymn will be hymn 134, I Believe in Christ, after which the invocation will be offered by Jonathan Marchant. And then um, just note that our organist for our hymns today is a granddaughter-in-law, Lori Marchant. And after the... Um, why don't, we, why don't we have the opening hymn and the invocation, and then I'll announce the rest of the program. So, uh, 134, I believe in Christ.
we come before the day with gratitude for this opportunity we have to celebrate the, the life and legacy of Grandpa Lofo. We ask you to bless us with thy spirit through this meeting that we will be able to feel the comforting power of the Holy Ghost, especially those who will speak and sing and take in any other part in this program. Please comfort them and help them to deliver their messages and their talents in a way that would be pleasing unto them and unto me. We ask you to bless all of us as we mourn our loss to be mindful of the the reward that Grandpa is receiving at this time and to be able to remember our Savior and His atoning sacrifice that makes it possible for us to see Him again. We say these things in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'll just quickly outline the rest of the program. And so we'll have a life sketch by Shalomi. Say that right? Shalomai. Thank you. Shalomai Littlefort, who's a daughter in law. After that, Rebecca Marchant, who's a daughter, will be a speaker. And then we'll have a special musical number by the, the, by the great grandchildren. And they'll be accompanied by Seth Littlefort, who's a grandson. And then we'll have a speaker, Luther Littlefort, who's a grandson. And then uh, another speaker, Jeff Littleford, who's a son. And then we'll have another musical selection, Be Still My Soul, by granddaughters Jordan Kennedy, Maddie Smith, Cammy Hudson on the viola, and accompanied by Janet Littleford, who's a daughter-in-law. After that, Curtis Littleford, who's a son, will speak. And then Melissa O'Driscoll, who's a daughter, will speak. And then I'll do the closing remarks. We'll go to that point in program. Um, I appreciate everyone coming to celebrate uh, sorry, Mark's legacy. He left an impression on so many of us. Mark S. Littleward, 87, of Francis, Utah, passed away peacefully with his family by his side on November 23, 2022, in Hiram, Utah. Born February 20, 1935, in Hiram, Utah. Sorry, I'm just a little bit nervous. Okay, so born February 20th, 1935 in Lehigh, Utah to Seth Forrester Littleford and Thelma May Richards Littleford. He was the second of three children. He graduated from Lehigh High School in 1953. He married Marilyn Hunter on April 11th, 1958 in the Salt Lake LDS Temple. Upon completion of his bachelor's degree from Brigham Young University, they moved to Southern California, where he taught and completed his master's degree from Long Beach State. His daughter Rebecca and son Jeffrey were born in California. In 1969, he accepted a position with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Western Samoa, where they lived for four years. His second son Curtis was born in Samoa. He had the opportunity to meet and collaborate closely with many journal authorities over that time. Many wonderful memories and close friendships were created. In 1973, the family moved to Francis, Utah, where he took a position as a high school principal at South Summit High School. His second daughter, Melissa, was born shortly after moving to Francis. He completed his doctorate in 1976 from Brigham Young University. A few years later, he took the position of superintendent at South Summit School District, where he worked for many years. Not wanting to retire too early, he continued working for the state in education for a few more years 
totaling more than 50 years as an educator. Mark was an active member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Throughout his life, he served a mission to Central Atlantic States Mission. He served in state presidencies in Samoa, bishoprics, and as the bishop of the Francis Utah Ward. He loved teaching gospel doctrine, and he had a wealth of knowledge. He also loved working in the temple and spent untold hours over the past few years serving there. His first passion was his family, especially his dear wife, Marilyn, whom he took unbelievable care of in the last few years. His favorite pastime was riding horses in the mountains above Camas Valley. He was an unbelievable horseman and had a driving passion when it came to all things horses. Survivors include his children, Becky, Kelly, Martin, Jeffrey, Shalmai, Littleford, Curtis, Janet, Littleford, Missy, Justin, O'Driscoll. He and Marilyn together had 15 grandchildren and 19 great-grandchildren. And his sister, Joyce, he is preceded in death by his wife, Marilyn, parents, and brother, Roy Littleford. I thought a lot about, sorry, <laughs> I thought a lot about life for the past week, and I've come to understand how short it is. I'm going to try to get through this. <laughs> Saying goodbye seems so final, so instead I'm going to say, I'll see you soon, and maybe you'll feel the same way. I'll see you in the sunrise at dusk and with every leaf that falls from the tree. I'll see you in the snow-capped mountains and every hoof print on the ground. I'll see you off the trail, rushing through the trees. I'll see you as I look across the valley of this small town. I'll see you at the cafe. I'll see you in the wild mustangs as they run free. I'll see you when I put my boots on for a ride. I'll see you and my children as they grow tall and strong. I'll see you and my grandbabies when they take their first steps. I'll see you as I serve others. I'll see you as I visit the sick, as I rake leaves, as I bring food. I'll see you as I walk down the road, tears in my eyes. I'll see you when I smile and when I laugh. I'll see you when I graduate. I'll see you when I hear your favorite song or hymn. I'll see you when I bless our new baby. I'll see you as my sweet child is baptized. I'll see you when I get married. I'll see you at birthday parties and celebrations. I'll see you in your sons and daughters. I'll see you in my reflection. I'll see you in heaven, Papa. I hope they have German chocolate cake and boy. Save us some bees. I'll see you soon. My wish is we try to remember Mark as he was. He lived a life of dedication, of passion, and he didn't wait to live his life. He just did. He showed up for our families. He was an incredible father-in-law and grandfather. He loved his family. He loved the faith. He served others well. I hope we see Mark in all the things we do. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. so many fond memories of death and we all said the things we wanted to we would be here for a really long time and that's not how we're supposed to do um, 
we used to tease each other about who was dad's favorite child or whatever, but any of you that know Doug will know that he had an ability to make whoever he was with feel like the most best friend, best neighbor, favorite kid, grandkid. He was just kind of accepting of everybody. I remember him from being a small child as a safe and secure place for me. And he still is today, just not in this way. Our dad, especially when he was younger, had the travel bug all the time and when we were in California, um, one summer after the school year got done, he, um, he and mom loaded a jet plane to a VW van and we explored the western U.S. and maybe we went into Mexico maybe and it took like a month on the road. I don't have a lot of memories because I was pretty young but I've seen all the pictures and it was a great experience. He was always um, up for adventure and I don't think his family, extended family, was too surprised when he decided to take the job with the church education system and have us move to Samoa. And that was a great place to be a kid. And Jeff and I have fond memories. We were quite young too, but um, I just I remember a couple of memories. Uncle Roy and his whole family came and visited us. And when my grandma Littleford passed away, our grandpa Littleford came and stayed with us for about nine months. And Kurt was born, and he was Grandpa Littleford's sidekick, and they hung out all the time. And he used to try to make things fun. I was really afraid of needles at a young age, and I got sick with something there. And would have to, that you could only go into the hospital in Opia to get a shot, and I didn't want to do it. I had to go every day for a week, but Dad promised, he asked if it would be better if he would take me on the back of his motorcycle, so that made it okay. <laughs> I was baptized in Samoa, and he taught me a valuable gospel principle there because there's a place in a village called Soniatu that President David O. McKay dedicated that place and prayed there, and there's a monument to him, and he declared it to be one of the most beautiful spots on the earth. And I was determined to be baptized in the beautiful pond and the waterfall, and Dad taught me at that time it's not about the location, it's about the ordinance and being baptized with your peers in the stake center. And so I did, and it was fine. Um, we did have a lot of good experiences there when the company would come. And Mom was a great hostess, and um, the general authorities who would come in was a good to us kids. Um, one tender short experience I'll share, President Packer was there in, I don't remember, Year, but he spoke about it in a conference talk in 2012. And at the, uh, near the end of his talk, he said something along the lines of how he didn't like to tell too much of sacred stories because it would lessen their value. But he and Dad were supposed to go over to the other island of Savai'i and do, they did what was called a midweek state conference, I believe. And there was a really bad storm, so they flew over. But the charter plane that was going to bring them back to our island couldn't get there because of a tropical storm. So they were able to get a boat, and the storm was terrible. The boat was small. They were, it was like 13 miles in rough seas, and Dad was spread eagle on the ground of the boat, holding onto the rail to keep from being washed overboard, and had cuts on his head. And, um, but the rail kept him from being washed away. And I don't think I remember Dad getting on a boat after that. <laughs> he did not love the water anymore. Um, but it was a sacred experience to learn about as I got older. And, I mean, I knew something was up, but... Um, I mean, in high school, I had the normal teenage emotions, and I remember one night he came up home after something had happened. I don't even remember what um, that was difficult for him, and he sat me down, and. He just said, I need you to know that no matter what you ever do in your life, I could never love you less. I might not prove of what you do, but I'll always love you. And I take comfort in that, always. Kelly and I started dating at 16. And when Kelly went on his mission, I waited for him. And 
The dad was very comforting, and I know I drove them crazy. And at that time, President Kimball came out with the 18-month mission. And so Kelly had his choice to come home early at the 18 months, and my parents were convinced that was inspiration directly for them. <laughs> They were ready to be done. But he's always been supportive of us and never made the typical, mis typical mistakes of young parents and newlyweds. He was never critical. We could go to him for advice. And we know that our kids and grandkids have felt grandpa was a safe place as well, like me. You know, he had some amazing one liners and jokes. Some were only appropriate for the pasture. <laughs> but he was fond of telling people that. Grandparents and grandchildren get along so well because they have a common enemy. <laughs> but even in his last days, he was still teaching us. And when he would become lucid, he would bear testimony. Really recently, he talked about President Nelson being foreordained and how he knew that. And then Kelly and I had discussed with him from President Ballard's recent book that if you can lead this life with your testimony intact, then you're in good shape. And I can testify. As anyone knows him, that he was that. His testimony was intact. He would bear testimony and pray even when he wasn't quite right in his mind. So I'm grateful for Dad, his constant loving example, and how much we can be together again. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
a demo, I always left feeling like I had a better understanding of who I am and a desire, and a desire to change my habits to better myself, whether in my personal life or in the gospel. I feel like he and I are very similar in the sense that we both hate being the center of attention. Um, we love being around our family and just visiting. I personally love being around my family when we all get together. I may not talk a whole lot, but I love just enjoying everyone and being with one another. One of the things he taught me was the world is not always white and black. There is more gray than anything. There are so many decisions you make in a day <coughs> that fall into gray areas, and rarely do you make just black and white decisions. Which is why God gave us agency. We get to choose every day and make decisions, whether good or bad, because that is what we are here for, to learn and be taught by others just as he taught me. One of the things that he taught me, that we can all do things through our, through our Christ. None of us are perfect, but just as Grandpa did, we can learn and grow from our mistakes. We can make each other's lives better. <coughs> and by loving and caring for them. This is also a commandment and a responsibility. With God, all things are possible, and Grandpa is a wonderful example of that. He taught me a lot about horses. If you are not in control or aware of your surroundings, you can get hurt. One story that always comes to mind when I was really little, we were in the field saddling the horses. I was standing there, looking directly behind the horse. Next thing I know, my arm is being grabbed so hard. My shoulder gets ripped out. Next thing I know, I'm standing behind on the side of the horse, watching the horse kick right where my head was. I learned that day very quickly to never stand behind the horse. <laughs> um, my shoulder still hurts. <laughs> um, Dad, I know where we both get our sarcasm from. It's definitely from Grandpa. Every time I would visit him when I was younger, I would always walk in and he would always look at me and say, Who's that other guy? Who's that other guy? <laughs> um, it always made me laugh. However, the last thing he said to me while in the hospital, he looked at me and he said, You're a very handsome young man. Well, maybe it's true that I am handsome. My grandpa said that, and not my mom told me all the time. <laughs> I know this truth is true. I know he's in heaven with grandma, and a joke at all, and we trust to join him someday. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. They just aren't the words uh, to describe certain things, and that's certainly true in this case. And there are other occasions in life where the, the English language just does not adequately, or has not adequately developed to the point where we can describe some of our emotions and our feelings and our thoughts. So my hope today is that the Spirit will guide that and make those understandings um, easier uh, for us to gain. Um, Mixed emotions, right? You have on one side, you have grief and loss and mourning, a uh, little bit of anxiety. Um, about how you move forward. Um, but then on the other hand, you contrast that with joy and happiness, relief for dad from the physical <coughs> aspects. And... Uh, peace that comes from knowing that, and also gratitude. And it's the latter of these words, gratitude, that I would like to center my, my thoughts around today. Um, gratitude, um, as defined in the dictionary, is a noun, so it's a thing. Um, that much I remember from English classes. Um, and various versions of that word can turn it into an adjective or into two other things. Um, I want to kind of ignore the grammatical side of things today and talk about gratitude from a behavioral standpoint. And my thoughts, which are not unique to me, I stole shamelessly as, as I did research for this, but uh, being a noun, I, 
think behaviorally, uh, we'd, we'd like to suggest and find some ways that we can turn that noun into a verb. And we make that something of action. Um, when we... We know that uh, in looking at gratitude and how to show our gratitude, um, I didn't attempt to try to make an exhaustive list because I know that would be impossible. And I think showing gratitude is individualistic to each one of us, each one of us uh, depending upon our skill sets and our talents and having to do that. Um, so rather than try to make an exhaustive list, what I would like to do is suggest a couple of things uh, for us to get started on um, how that process might work for us. Uh, there are two things that kind of complete a circle. Um, and I don't mean to oversimplify, but I do feel like they're, they're holistic from the standpoint of, the first one is self-care. Uh, we learn more about that um, over the last several years, and we hear more talk of it. And I think it's critical that we take care of ourselves from a, an emotional standpoint, spiritual standpoint, a mental standpoint, and a physical standpoint. Um, not always going to be perfect, but we need to focus on those and make sure that we're filling that well or filling that tank. The other aspect, which I think completes that circle, is um, taking care of others and providing service for others in the same sense of uh, physical, mental, emotional, and physical well-being. Um, and I think that provides the balance. Um, we can't help other folks if we're not taking care of ourselves and we have something in the tank to give. On the other hand, if we have all this stuff in the tank or if the well is full and we're not sharing that with others or helping others, then we get borderline selfish and we're not doing the things that we know we need to do. <coughs> so it, it's definitely a balance of those things. Um, and I know each of us have skill sets and talents and there are many ways we can help other people. Um, there may be someone someday that comes along and, and creates or finds a cure for cancer. Millions and millions of dollars donated to charities. Um, I think for most of us, it's much more simplistic than that. I mean, get this example for my father. Um, just simply saying hi to somebody who looks like they need to be seen. Listening empathetically. Not trying to create your response or, oh, I had a similar experience, I can't wait to show my experience. But just listen. Uh, mourn with those that mourn. Let them know that you're sorry for the things they're going through. And that doesn't mean you're apologizing. It doesn't mean you're trying to say you're guilty of something. It's just empathetic listening. Be happy when people tell you they're happy. Just notice people in any way you can. Because you never know, never know what impact those few moments will have on an individual. And I know that's how my father always gained so many friends and acquaintances, acquaintances took care of his family, those spontaneous in the moment, I care about you and I'm listening to you. So we all have that opportunity. So I leave those two suggestions with you. Um, I think in order to do that, I, I do have to, to share some gratitude. Um, first and foremost for my wife, for her patience and diligence, and especially patience, did I already say that and again? Um, especially the last few weeks. Um, she's just been absolutely amazing and fantastic. And I love her and appreciate her for all of that. My kids, my grandkids, were just amazing and light up my world when I see them, every single one of them. And, uh, I'm grateful for my siblings and their families for their patience and understanding and the ability to get along in times like these and just make things happen um, and not turn issues into anything about a me, but it's us and we're, we're working through those. Um, grateful for extended family, both the Hunter and the Laporte side over the decades. Absolutely phenomenal families um, on both sides, always there. Celebrations and parties, times like these and weddings. Uh, as they get older, there's fewer and fewer of us, but still coming. And I appreciate that. I've been blessed with a wonderful, wonderful family. Um, grateful to friends and neighbors who have been here in the valley and other places, and particularly the neighbors here over the last several years, who have just gone out of their way 
to take care of mom and dad and keep him busy and put up with him horse riding all the time and going with him. Um, it's deeply appreciated. Grateful for my mother. Most importantly, I'm grateful, <laughs> grateful for my father. Um, I'm going to share just one brief story. Uh, I have hundreds and hundreds, and most of them are humorous. This one, a little humor in it, but, but more want to share the, my gratitude for his wisdom in what was a very simple, simple thing. Uh, in my early teenage years, we were riding horses um, east of the house there, and we'd gotten up to about where Crittenden's corral was, about where those new storage units are up there. And the mare I was on, and Kurt, I'm not stealing your story, but I think we'll be talking about the same horse. Um, can take her soul. <coughs> she decided she was going home. So she uh, bucked across the road and rode and bolted back uh, to the west towards the house. And I got her reined in and stopped, and I was pretty proud of myself. I jumped off the horse, and in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, what? I just did the NFR qualifying saddlebone ride. You know, this is paycheck and belt buckle ride right here. Um, I mean, the reality was she probably curl hopped a couple and not much more than a trot back towards the house. But I got her stopped. I got off. And before he knew it, Dad was right there on the other horse. And his first words were, get back on the horse. And it baffled me a little bit. I'm, you know, glorying in my ability to, to keep my hind end in the saddle. And uh, he said, yeah, get back on the horse. And he said it very kindly. but firmly as he could and so I got back on the horse and I didn't say anything we started riding again and going back out and he said you know she won right and I'm like no I won <laughs> I, I stayed on the horse I pulled her to a stop I got off I you know I won but of course I didn't say anything I was like okay where's this going I'm not quite sure I understand and he said her goal was to get you off her back and it didn't matter how she wanted to do it. She did it, right? And you got off. And I thought about that. And I've thought about that one dozens and dozens of times over the years. Um, and I've learned to realize just how wise and the wisdom my father has. It taught me humility, <laughs> first of all. Um, that just when I realize I'm, I think I'm doing good or doing well, that you know, you, you need to keep things in perspective and understand how those things go. Uh, as I've grown, it's, I reflect on that, it's taught me patience and endurance. And in fact, you have to finish what you started. And you can't get lost in the moment and lose other things because of that. Um, and don't get me wrong, he was always very complimentary and very encouraging on how we, we wrote and developed and, and did those things. But as I get older, I realize the depth of his wisdom and that one short story that didn't really make sense to me then. Um, and I remember that often and I remember that one very, very positively. Like I said, there are lots of other stories that are more humorous, but I, I won't share those uh, today. Some of those I keep right there. Um, I, uh, Again, grateful for, for all the things I've had. I, I would be remiss at this point. I'd just say I'm grateful for my Father in Heaven. I'm grateful for the Savior and the plan of salvation and all that they've done uh, for us and the opportunity we have. Um, so grateful for the, the life that my Father led here in mortality. And uh, he's been able to move on to bigger and better things. Um, in relation to the plan of salvation, my wife has a quote she likes to say often, and I hope I get it straight, but it's very simple, it's very straightforward, and I think it's a perfect summation of the plan of salvation, particularly mortality. And it simply says, quote, we are all just trying to help each other get home. End quote. And that's it, right? Everything else we do can be explained. And so because of that, it is my hope and my desire today that each one of us can, can figure out what our skills 
and our talents are, and many of us know what they are, but we'll continue to develop them. And through those skills and talents and our ability to, to do that, that we take that now, gratitude, and then each and every one of us can turn it into a verb and make life better just because we have existed. And uh, say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
So I tried as hard as I could with my siblings to trade after that song. No one would take me up on that. <laughs> uh, I'm fine with being done right there. That's, that's the message. Um, so Dad gave me a word limit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe because I was more like him than he thinks, but so I'm going to stick to my script today so I don't ramble on and we don't extend things any longer than he would want to. But as you can see, if our family has a fault, we have some. We've got a few. Um, but one is maybe we love. So I can only imagine the reunion that must be happening on the other side of the veil. Many of you know that Mom was a huge proponent of and dedicated to family and made sure we met often. Dad lost his mom back in 1969, right before I was born, and always spoke of her very, very highly. The lessons he learned from her, among many, were being humble, Courageous, hardworking, and independent, but he never showed too much emotion. Yet somehow I knew he really loved her. So that reunion, I can see it. I pictured <coughs> Grandma, who I never met, but feel, and Mom right there at the front of the line, there to greet him, among many others. My pa, as he sometimes liked to be called, was many things. Many of you would have known him, as has been mentioned, as a horseman, a scholar, an educator teacher, dollhouse and barn maker, ambitious, hardworking, honest, and I agree with all of those descriptions and can tell you stories about each one of them. And I will. No. <laughs> but there are a couple. Dad got his first horse, named Flash, back when he was about 10 years old. It would have been around 1945. He had a job where early in every morning and every evening, he would herd the neighbor's milk cows, about 10 or 12 head, from a field down the road to the milk barn. A second job he had at that time, and this story is in his words, another job I had around the age 10 to 12 years old was a paper route I delivered the papers on my horse, Flash. One time while I was delivering papers, for some reason, I got the idea that I was going to run away from home and go to, go to California. I rode west, headed out to Cedar Fort, and made it to the Jordan River, just a few miles away from home. After I stopped to give my horse, Flash, some water, I tried to keep on with my journey but he refused to go another step. There was nothing I could do to make him move forward. He wouldn't let me run away. So I finally gave up and went back home. I didn't tell anyone about trying to run away, but I got a lot of calls that night from people wondering where their papers were. <laughs> Throughout his life, Dad has had many horses. Some, as Jeff mentioned, better than others. And he taught me early on, like he did Jeff, that you work with the horse, but you are in charge. And a saying that I still remember, and he said, if you forget everything else, it's always very simple. Keep your left leg on the left side, your right leg on the right <laughs> side, and you keep your mind in the middle. <laughs> Words of wisdom to live by. He had a way with them that he said he learned from his grandfather. Firm, but never break the horse's spirit. Dad would readily admit that he wasn't a straight-A student in high school. He liked learning and always had a wide variety of classes. 
He also worked as much as he could during those years to supplement his activities and to not be a burden on his family. And Dad shared this story with us, and again in his words. My senior year, I had an experience that shaped my life. I took an IQ type test, and my principal told me that given my low results, instead of taking a college education path, it would be better for me to be a laborer. In my mind, I said, like hell I will. <laughs> I decided then and there that my achievements would not be dedicated, dictated by tests and what people told me I could or could not do. Most of you know and have heard that Dad went on to become very well educated with a bachelor's, a master's, and a doctorate degree. Led all my lessons in life. His grandson Seth has mentioned many times that Grandpa taught us to never stop learning. While taking care of Mom, Dad started a new hobby of making dollhouses and toy barns. He's made several, focusing on the grandkids and great-grandkids and then many, many more, even donating some to charity for fundraising. I know that our kids and their children have spent countless hours playing and decorating those dollhouses, and they've become a priceless representation of his love and dedication. Dad taught me how to respect others, especially Mom. There's a lot of stories in this one, <laughs> but I won't. I'll just say that being disrespectful or disobedient didn't usually go over so well. We learned early how to serve. When mom and dad had one of their various callings, which were many, we were always there setting up tables, chairs, hauling food, cleaning up, delivering gifts and food, especially to the widows in the area. Even though that was often hard work and a little inconvenient, I learned to enjoy those times. And if I did a good enough job, maybe get rewarded with one of the treats that were made for somebody else. So from the grandkids, Grandpa was very thoughtful, and he kept carrying on for Grandma after she was gone. When Maddie got meningitis on her birthday, Grandpa showed up with a bouquet of roses for her. After Grandma passed and Cammie had her baby, Grandpa drove up to Logan with a welcome gift of diapers and bum cream, he called it. <laughs> Something Grandma would have done. Our kids really enjoyed and relied on Grandpa for his counsel, advice, and wisdom about almost anything. Seth and Grandpa were two peas in a pod. They would often sit and have meaningful, deep, philosophical discussions for hours on end. In the end, Grandpa would always tell him to live his dream. Dad learned these traits firsthand from his growing up years. His mom was often in poor health with a serious heart condition. Housework, cooking, cleaning chores were never beneath him. Although he was at times a great cook, he loved to come up with his own recipes once in a while. When he got in that mood, and when we asked what was for dinner, he would say with great excitement, missionary stew. <laughs> that didn't excite us as much as it did him, <laughs> because that usually meant cleaning out anything and everything in the fridge and opening a few cans of something to disguise it. <laughs> he would also love to make his cabbage and hot dogs, which also took me a while to acquire the taste for it, but after some practice, it was okay. Dad told us this quote, If my parents were to leave a message to me and to my posterity, I think they would, they would have said, be honest, hardworking, earn your keep, don't depend on others to provide your income for you, do the best you can with what you've got. Be loyal to your mate and enjoy life. During COVID, my wife
wife Janet spent many, many hours calling and visiting with Dad and writing down all of the stories she could get from him. Those were precious times for her and our family. And that work resulted in a wonderful family history of Mark and Marilyn. Many of the stories you're hearing today and more are documented in that book. It's a wonderful tribute and history of their lives and life together. And a final lesson that Dad taught us, and maybe taught it before, but maybe I just didn't pay attention. And that's another one I'll mention later. <laughs> but he said this simple phrase in profound wisdom, it's not all about you. I've spent several years pondering those relatively few words of wisdom. My own kids have also learned a lot about this life lesson. To me, this simple phrase points back to the way he lived his life. His life was always about others. Along with all of the mentioned descriptions, and more importantly, Dad was also a husband, father, grand and great-grandfather, brother, uncle, and friend. Above all, though, he is a child of God. The thing I remember, and perhaps cherish most, was his example of dedication, loyalty, and love. Many recall Dad's constant dedication to watching over and caring for Mom during many difficult and challenging years of declining health and ability. After Mom passed, Dad became very independent and didn't like or want to ever impose on others. He filled his days with horses and keeping up the yard and house, then dedicating his time to temple service several times a week for many hours a day. I witnessed my dad continue to learn about his true identity and exercising and sharing his knowledge and testimony of that several times. He was quick to point out that he didn't completely understand how it would all specifically work out in the end and on the other side, but he had no doubt that eternity would be wonderful. He did have some reservations and would often mention to me that he may not have been good enough. Well, Paul, I'm certainly not the judge. But from what I personally witnessed of your life, something tells me you will likely hear these words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye now into the rest of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Before I share a few of my thoughts and memories, I just also want to extend a heartfelt thank you to each and every one of you for your love and your friendship. We love each of you and you are an important part in Dad's life and you're an important part in our lives. And uh, we say hello to Aunt Joyce, Dad's sister, who's watching from Montana. Hopefully that's going through okay. Um, and I asked her if she had any thoughts that she would like me to share in her behalf today. And she said, to say how special it was to have him as my big brother. He was with me in some difficult times and will be missed until we can be a family together again forever. Family is everything. Um, I'll try to talk fast. I'm going to share a few of my, my memories from my earliest days. I remember um, sitting on Dad's lap in the evenings. He would let me sit on the chair with him and we'd rock and watch TV. Uh, my siblings got to stay up later than me because I was the youngest, and I would beg to stay up later, and that was usually in vain. Um, and so I, I was scared also because there were monsters that lived upstairs. So Dad <laughs> took pity on me, and he would often carry me upstairs to bed. And I remember dancing in the kitchen 
He would let me stand on his feet and we learned to dance like the waltz style and he taught me the steps. He was a great dancer and him and mom really enjoyed dancing together. That was something that they loved doing. I remember eating breakfast together in the mornings before school and he would eat healthy things like total and you know those grainy yucky cereals that are good for you and I would eat my lucky charms. And, and we were out of milk one morning and one morning he grabbed a jug of orange juice and said, here, try this, and improvise with this. So I was really excited. I thought, oh, this could be the start of something new and wonderful. I'll try orange juice. And, oh, I was sorely of disappointed. It tasted terrible. So I was thankful he didn't make me finish it, and I just got to dump it down the sink, and we were never, we were never going to try that again. Um, I remember him giving me rides and loving our rides together to school. I didn't have to ride the bus. I got to ride with Dad in the mornings to school. And I learned at an early age that because of his position in the high school, um, that there were eyes, there were going to be sets of eyes everywhere. So I need to be on my best behavior. And as he would say, mind your P's and Q's. Um, Mom and Dad, as has been kind of mentioned, they ran a tight ship. They uh, did not tolerate disrespect and they followed through with consequences. Uh, they were a great team and they were united. And it was a high priority in their home that we were taught the gospel. And I loved our family home evening lessons. Mom had a felt board with our names and it would rotate through who had the lesson, who had the, the treat and the song and the prayers. And, and I loved that and that time and um, the object lessons. And, and I remember a specific object lesson that Dad gave about the body and our spirits and how well, they're two separate things. And I can still see it really vividly in my mind where he was standing down in the family room when he had a glove on his hand and he pulled the glove off and was explaining, this is the body. And he showed his hand and was explaining how that's the spirit. And I am so grateful for that knowledge that they taught, that taught me and it's a tender mercy. I think that that's a, one of the sharpest memories I have of a gospel lesson because I know that's the case for him that his spirit definitely lives on. And I'm grateful for their teachings. Um, I rarely missed going to a basketball or a football game with Dad, and at, at that time it was my life's greatest aspiration to be cheerleader. So I went and I learned all of the cheers, and the girls were so cute with me. Um, and, and I thought it was so magical because we had this key ring that had a retractable chain, and it was just chock full of keys. But it got us anywhere we wanted to go in the building. In the old high school, they had those metal partition gates, and his keys would open up and get us through anywhere. And um, I knew which key was to the candy machine, too. He would always let me truck clear up by his office at the front of the building, and he would get in the candy machine and let me pick out a candy bar. So I probably owe the school for some candy bars. Um, he would let me have that treat. Um, I look forward to his pancakes and homemade maple syrup on Saturday mornings. Um, and when I was about six or seven, I watched the movie Jaws, and it kind of traumatized me. Because in my mind now, this great white shark was living in every body of water, and it's, it's including our toilets and our bathtub. And one night, Mom was gone, and when it was bath time, he sent me upstairs to go take my bath, and I was not going to get in that tub. Because one, there were monsters up there, and two, now there's a great white shark waiting for me in the drain. And, um, so I know I wasn't up there for very long, and I wasn't even clever enough to turn the water on to make him think that like he could hear it, like, oh yeah, she's taking her bath. So I came back downstairs, and he asked me if I'd taken my bath, and I said, yeah. And he said, let me see your hands. And he took my hands, and he said, let's smell them. I'm sure they still had dirt under my nails, and, and he sniffed my hands, and he said, come on, let's go. I thought, oh no, I'm going to be in trouble, he's going to be so mad. And he wasn't. He was so patient and he just sat with me and he filled the tub up and I even got bubbles. And the thing that sticks out to me is that he didn't, he was probably frustrated and annoyed and maybe wanted to be watching his TV show. But I needed him with me and he protected me. And I'm so grateful that he was patient. And that was my dad. He was my protector. Um, and one other story from my really young days. When he was alive, this would have been an incriminating story, but I think it's probably safe to tell now. But um, on the east, the neighbors that live right on the east side of us, where the snow grows live now, 
they were about to say kind of a rough, rough bunch. And they had a dog, and their dog was really territorial and not nice. And I would be standing in the backyard, and sometimes she would just bolt over. Or they had a daughter who was a year older than me, and sometimes I'd want to go in their backyard and play, and the dog would come running at me. And so I was really scared of this dog. And back then, at the old Francis Church, which was just up the road from our house, and in the warm summer months, we would often walk to and from church. And I was just little. I remember walking home from church and all of a sudden this dog comes bolting out from their yard and just chasing after me. And I'm pretty sure I fell down and scraped my knees, which I did a lot because I was not graceful, but um, I was just waiting for this dog to take a bite out of my calf or something, you know. But uh, I got away and got home and was really scared about it, so I was scared of this dog. Well, a short while later, this dog suddenly died. <laughs> and um, it mysteriously died. And all I ever knew, you know, I was just grateful. I didn't have to worry about this dog anymore. I could go over and play with the neighbors and I could walk to and from church in safety and I didn't have to worry about that anymore. Well, I didn't find out until years later that this dog did not die of natural causes or of old age. Uh, Dad took some antifreeze and injected it into a hot dog and tossed it over the fence. And he uh, consulted, I guess, with the local veterinarian and was telling him probably about the problem. And uh, this was his suggestion of how to take care of the problem and not leave any trace <clears throat> or uh, any further yeah, law enforcement action. Um, so I'm really grateful that he protected me from that dog and he was willing to do whatever it took to, to protect me. Um, and as Ben mentioned some things that stand out in my mind, there's some of Dad's favorite things were road trips with Mom. They loved to travel in the car. And even after she passed, sometimes he would just still get in the car and take off. And one day he called and said, I'm in Coast Wyoming today. And so that was awesome. He was so adventurous. He loved turquoise, he loved his turquoise watches and rings and bolo ties and jewelry. And as it was mentioned, he loved pie, but the, thin, the crust had to be super thin. And so mom made sure that she rolled that crust out really thin. And his favorite was mincemeat, which I tried to like, but never could. So he usually got the whole pie to himself. Nobody else really liked it. Um, he loved his mom's homemade vanilla ice cream, Grandma Thelma's ice cream, and mom got the recipe. And they continued to make that for years and years around the 4th of July. That will make vanilla ice cream. He liked liver and onions. He loved beans, um, peanut butter, and as Sean I mentioned, that German chocolate cake and that vanilla ice cream. And when I was growing up, I remember he would have a bowl of ice cream almost every single night. That was his special treat. Um, and Kurt mentioned the missionary stew, which none of us really cared for too much but him. Um, we know that he loved books and he had a great love of learning. Um, when I was in high school, I remember him telling me that he was working on learning a new word every day and that he was reading the encyclopedia. And I was so impressed by that. Um, and yeah, it was great. It was great. Um, he loved music. He loved classical music. He was, I think, what Jeff called an educated cowboy. Uh, he loved classical music and he um, had a beautiful tenor voice. And mom had a beautiful, strong alto voice, and so they sang often. I remember them singing at funerals, and a favorite was Let Me Call You Sweetheart. And they sang in the word choir, and uh, enjoyed those years. And Kurt and I even went sometimes and sang in the choir in the Francis Ward. He was a wise and eloquent speaker. He was chivalrous and very much a gentleman to my mom and to the women in his life. I remember after dinners, he wouldn't go sit in the chair. He stood and he was there at the sink washing dishes and helping us clean up. Um, I think his knowledge of the gospel and that coupled with the minor that he, he had in psychology helped him to be a wonderful person to go to for counsel and advice. People often sought him out for, for counsel and, and that was wonderful to get advice and counsel from him. Um, and I think that helped him in his career. I remember him saying that with the schools, the kids were usually pretty great to deal with. It was the parents who were difficult and much more challenging than the kids. 
Um, he didn't tolerate monkey business, but sometimes he was the biggest goofball, and he would do this crazy walk where he'd throw his legs around and throw his arms around and act like he just escaped from, from some kind of institution or something and try to embarrass us. And I remember being in the store with my friends sometimes, he'd walk up to the shelves and just start grabbing random items off the shelves and putting them in our hands and then walking off. <laughs> And he had, of course, his own special version of the Happy Birthday song. I, he sounded kind of like maybe a drunken sailor. I don't know. It was really cute, though, and no birthday was complete without that Happy Birthday song. Um, and I just wanted to also mention a couple of things. I love to, to listen to him tell stories from his childhood. And um, he shared a story one time that when he was a little boy, he said a representative from the Red Cross came by asking for donations. And he told them they couldn't donate because they were poor. And he said that his mom took a soup plate and bumped him on top of the head for saying that. They must have embarrassed her. <laughs> and then between his junior and senior year of high school, he would hitchhike to Saratoga Springs. And one time he was riding in a truck on the way back, and he was standing up in the back, and he had his hands up on the cab of the truck. And the truck made a real sharp turn, and he fell out of the truck. And uh, he was in a coma in the hospital for three days. And uh, he wasn't able to play football his senior year of high school. Um, Dad was blessed with the gift of faith. <clears throat> um, until he was about 14 years old, his parents weren't active in the church, but Dad went because he said that he liked it. And after high school, he went to BYU for about for two semesters, and then he had a desire to serve a mission. Dad said that one of the things he remembers most about his patriarchal blessing was that it talks about him being a lifelong missionary. And uh, to this point, I remember visiting Temple Square as a teenager. We were going through the visitor center, and there was a man behind us who was by himself. And Dad kind of took a few steps back and started talking with this man. And I was trying to kind of lean back and see if I could hear what he was saying to him. But he started talking to him about the Book of Mormon and I recommended that he read it and was telling him what a wonderful book that it was. Um, and in Dad's day, missionary candidates did not submit, fill out and submit mission papers. They waited for a call to come from the bishop. And uh, in Dad's words, he said, I waited for the bishop, but he never, he never talked to me about it. My desire was so strong that one day I drove to his house and knocked on his door and asked him uh, if he was going to call me on a mission or not. He paused and then said, well, sure. <laughs> Dad's mission was in parts of Virginia, North Carolina, and West Virginia. And um, I'll share a couple experiences real quick from his mission that really stood out to me. And in his words, he said, Looking back on my mission, I can see there were dozens of times we were protected by miracles and divine intervention. We had several hurricanes while I was there. We could see them coming in, and if we were in the car, we would pull over. The hurricanes would pick up school buses and throw them down the street. One time, there was a hurricane that came through, and I remember the water came all the way up to our knees. I felt the experience of the hurricane, but was never harmed, and I didn't feel the anxiety of it. I know now that it was because I was be being protected and given peace. Several times we were saved from being attacked by dogs. So maybe that's where the sympathy came from me, from my dog experience, that he knew what it was like to be chased by dogs. Um, at one point, uh, Durham, North Carolina, and Duke University were part of his mission, and many of the students there were from high society and came from wealthy families, so they didn't have much success there. But he liked to walk around the campus of Duke University and go to the library. Surprise, surprise. He said, one time we were tracked in just outside the campus and went to a big mansion. A college student answered the door and said, back off, I have no interest in your hierarchy of idiots. We were polite, gritted our teeth, and left. He also said that it was in this area that I got a Dear John letter from a girl who was in, I was engaged to before my mission. She wrote and asked me if it was okay if she dated an old high school boyfriend. I, wrote, I was actually very relieved because I knew our engagement wasn't right. I told her to go ahead and date him and to drop the engagement ring off to my parents. It turned out to be the best for both of us. My mission companion and I took all of her letters and pictures and had a burning party. <laughs> At the beginning of the second year of his mission, he was called to the mission office in Roanoke, Virginia to be the mission secretary. He said, I helped keep track of the president, who was President Henry Smith, 
His budget books, re reports, and correspondence with Salt Lake City. When President Smith was gone, I was in charge of everything. This was a position of great responsibility which helped me gain confidence in myself and my abilities. I know this helped me be successful and deal with hard times later in my life. The president had two young daughters and I had to pick them up from school and transport them all over. I called them Miss Julie and Miss Myrna, which they liked and thought was very respectful. He traveled around the mission with President Smith and took notes for him um, at conferences. And uh, one night they were traveling late back from a conference and the mission president, or the President Smith and his wife were sleeping in the car. And Dad said, I thought I saw what looked like an elephant walking in the road ahead. I thought I was hallucinating, so I stopped and backed up. President Smith woke up and said, what's going on? I said, President Smith, would you look out the window and tell me what you see? He looked and saw the elephant too. We found out it had escaped from the circus in town and was wandering down the road. <laughs> Dad had a pretty high tolerance level, but there was a line, and once it was reached, it, you knew it wasn't going to be crossed. And this was even the case as he served as a young man on his mission and he um, had this following experience. He said, I got to meet all the new missionaries when they came in. There were two occasions when President Smith sent us to talk to elders who wanted to go home. One particular missionary I was talking to was being so hateful towards the prophet that I stood up and said, you shut your mouth or I'll shut it. I might be totally out of line. But one more word like that, and you'll find yourself on a blanket in the bathroom. <laughs> and one final miracle from his mission experience that he recorded, he said, we were assigned to start in West Virginia and work our way down the Blue Ridge Mountains through North Carolina and Tennessee. We were trying to track down all the members on record that we had lost track of and find out what had happened to them. We didn't have exact addresses, so we had to talk around and ask people. Eventually, we wanted to get the names of all the family members and try to organize some sort of church service. We had to travel and stay wherever the night found us. We tried to stay with mem members if we could. They were so hospitable, sometimes giving us their own beds. We were lucky to get three meals a day. One time, Elder Elsie and I counted over 16 meals in a row of fried eggs and grits. One night, driving up in the backwoods, we drove, our, we drove over a big rock and punctured the oil pan. We saw oil running out of the pan and knew it was ruined. There must have been three quarts on the ground. We found someone to stay with for the night and planned to look for a mechanic the next day. The next morning, when I under looked underneath the car, there was no oil on the ground. And the dipstick test showed us that all the oil was still there. We checked the pressure again, and it was fine. It was a miracle. The car never gave us trouble again. As Becky mentioned, in his last days, Dad was still testifying of his um, love of God and how he knew God exists, and the prophet Joseph Smith, and he said that he didn't want to go to the celestial or terrestrial kingdoms. Um, some of the last words I heard him say were, in essence, I'm ready to go, don't really want to be in here anymore, but... I'll do my best, and that he did. The day he passed, a card came for him from the ceiling office of the Provo Temple saying how they missed him and so appreciated his dedication and service. I can't really articulate the giant of a man that he is and the everlasting influence for good that he's had on me and all who knew and loved him. He never professed to be perfect and recognized recognized changes for the better that he made as he traveled along the path of life, which is the purpose of our time here. We're here to prove ourselves and to become new creatures. A quote he liked to say in his latter years, he said it was from Shakespeare, and um, he said, he would say, "'Twas me then, tis not me now." And he would wave his finger like that. As he became aged and having, was having the trouble he was, it's, it's so wonderful to know that he's free from all of that and is back in his prime. So once again, twas him then, tis not him now. And I'll close with this thought. Um, this truth is uh, taught by Elder Uke Dorf and it brings me so much peace and comfort. He said, in light of what we know about our eternal destiny, is it any wonder that whenever we face the bitter endings of life, they seem unacceptable to us? There seems to be something inside of us that resists endings. 
Why is this? Because we are made of the stuff of eternity. We are eternal beings, children of the Almighty God, whose name is endless and who promises eternal blessings without number. Endings are not our destiny. The more we learn about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more we realize that endings here in mortality are not endings at all. They are merely interruptions, temporary pauses that one day will seem small compared to the eternal joy awaiting the faithful. In his plan, there are no true endings, only everlasting beginnings. Dad was many wonderful things, and he was faithful. There is no doubt that eternal joy will be his. And I'll close with this, this thought. It said, what you leave behind is not what is engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Thank you, Dad, for leaving, leaving your wonderful self into our lives and into my life. I love you so much and will strive to make you proud and be worthy so that we can all live together forever through the mercy, grace, and the atonement of our dear Savior. Give Mama a hug for me and stay close. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> what a great service. I'm sure you made your dad proud, Grandpa. Um, <clears throat> I'll miss Brother Little Ford. I love him. And um, I'll miss hearing you say, Hey, old timer, how you doing? And saying it to the young men. Or saying, I'm not old yet, but I'll get there someday. Um, as I was listening to you talk, I wrote down some words that I thought described your grandpa and your father, your brother. Student, teacher, advisor, counselor, listener, very engaging, humble, courageous, wise, funny, loyal, warm, scholar, honest, integrity, generous, gifted chef. <laughs> I'm glad he didn't feed you any those special hot dogs, Curtis. <laughs> uh, pioneer, tough, strong, explorer, craftsman, selfless, servant, comforter, patient, kind, protector, gentleman, more than good enough, brother, husband, father, grandfather, disciple of Jesus Christ, and son of God. Um, just want to share a story with you. Um, he came to me uh, several years ago and said, uh, a few years ago, and said, Bishop, I have a lot of extra time and, and I've been blessed with some extra money and I want to share it with a young man, share both of them. And I've been praying and asking Heavenly Father who the young man is. And he said, Heavenly Father, you still meet your son. And, uh, But, Brother Little Ford, what he didn't know was how much my son was struggling at the time with, with life and with mental health and how much he needed a friend. to the Lord. He was a great friend of my son. And um, I said, Bishop, I'd like to teach him how to use power tools. Are you okay with that? He said, that would be great. <laughs> I'd like to teach him how to back up a horse trainer. Are you okay with that? That would be great. <laughs> and um, I'd like to teach him how to ride a horse. Would that be all right? That would be awesome. And because of your father and grandfather, my son loves horses and riding horses, and um, he's well today, he's, he 
is on a mission in St. Louis, Missouri, and doing well, and your dad and grandfather had a lot to do with that, so thank you. I asked my son, is there anything you'd like me to tell the family? He asked me to conduct, and he said, yeah, will you tell them a story? I said, sure, and he said, one of our horse rides, we came around the corner, and there was a bunch of sheep, and his horse kind of got scared and backed up. And he said he gave the spurs to the horse, disappeared in the trees. And he said, all of a sudden, I saw this big cloud of dust. And there's Brother Little Ford, 85 years old, I think, at the time. Weave sitting tall in the saddle, weaving in and out of the trees. Big cloud of dust, chasing sheep everywhere. <laughs> and he said, and then he rode up next to me and said, uh, people are like horses. You got to help them face their fears. <laughs> And uh, you have lots of teaching moments like that with, with your dad and grandfather. And um, he sent a message that I'd just like to share with you in closing. He said, um, I'm going to miss Brother Little Ford. I prayed and asked Heavenly Father to pass along a message and just tell him thanks for being my friend.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so very grateful for the beautiful service that we've been able to have here today for Grandpa Littleford. We're so thankful that family could gather together to share fond memories and share in each other's love. Please help us to fill of thy spirit in our grief. Please help family members to fill of the love that grandma and grandpa have for them and to know that their buttons are bursting with pride, but the good kind. Heavenly Father, please bless me. As we travel to the cemetery, we will be able to do so in safety. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, please stand.